So good. It looks like we have a good conception. And if you're uh, not fully aware of what, of what computer vision is, uh, you will definitely understand it by the end of this lecture. So, all right. So to give us a quick taste, so not only can it encompass, you know, object detection, but we also have, okay, let me have to reshare. Uh, this also includes stuff like self-driving cars. Um, and we'll go over a couple more applications as well. Um, all right, we should be able to watch this briefly. We'll just watch like a minute of it. So we'll notice, you know, we have the visual world here, you know, what a human would see. And you can see a sort of, sort of like a fully parsed out, fully interpreted um, world that the computer has obviously analyzed automatically. And you can see it's, it's clearly doing object detection, um, you know, different forms of classification, you know, where the road is, where the obstacles are. Um, using bounding boxes, which is a really common strategy. And, and I'm sure it's, it's also cross-referencing with GPS coordinates. So there's definitely like sort of a lot of interconnectedness with, with it doesn't just have to be using the visual systems as well. And as Leo said, uh, these would be like what's the, the actual model that's, that's running here, uh, these would be CNNs. So uh, not the pure neural networks that we're gonna be starting to learn about today, um, but this is sort of like the precursor to, to what are known as CNNs. Let me go back to here. All right, cool. So you can see it's just kind of driving how we want it. And, you know, performing classifications. So where humans can look around and see a stop sign and humans, I mean, this task, like maybe driving would be a bit more difficult, but like just noticing the existence of a stop sign. I mean, that's something that like, like a toddler could do like four years old, maybe. Um, and without machine learning, uh, this is, this task is essentially impossible. You can imagine, I think if, if, if this doesn't, you know, become apparent to you now, once we actually go over how images are represented in, in computers, we'll see immediately, immediately like that actually draw, writing, you know, hand coding an algorithm that could do this um, is just impossible. Like there's just too many angles. Again, even something nice and simple, like a stationary stop sign, um, like you could be viewing the stop sign from various different angles, uh, from different distances and all of that combined makes, um, you know, again, writing actually, you know, standard code to achieve this just in, essentially impossible. Um, you know, using like for loops and if else statements and stuff like that, like it's just not something you can do, which is why we need to turn to machine learning to attempt to solve these so-called intractable, intractable problems that are just too big um, to do by hand. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, this is one, one instance of machine learning. We have another or computer vision. We have a de definition here. Another instance here, uh, some Stanford researchers did, they just built a simple computer vision model to detect if someone, uh, you know, thoroughly or fully uh, washed their hands with hand sanitizer or not. So um, really anything that involves interpreting the real world, um, you could definitely um, apply computer vision to. Uh, some of the other less common applications that are, are actually pretty important are like satellite imagery analysis. Um, you, like any instance where there's just like an abundance of data, but not enough manpower to analyze it. Uh, that's where computer vision really shines. Uh, similarly, if you note like um, in like Google Street View, like they always uh, blur people's faces and they blur like license plates and stuff like that. And that's definitely not done by hand. There's just way too much data to ever like pay someone to actually just, you know, to, to do that automatically. So you have to train machine learning models, computer vision models, to detect, you know, things like license plates and faces and whatnot. And they do that pretty effectively. All right, so I kind of already went over these. You guys gave some good examples. Another common one would be Snapchat filters that involves, we'll see in a second, just simple face detection. So initially, you know, a simple pipeline here would be to detect the face, you know, generate a bounding box around the face. Um, and then you would, you know, once you've generated that bounding box, you know where the face is, you can kind of apply a more fine tooth comb to it and, and specifically detect like uh, important facial landmarks. And from there, you can see we generate a, um, 
you would generate yeah one second i'll yeah so you you from from the fa from the facial landmarks you would generate a 3d map and then once you have the 3d map it's very very easy to apply like the 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 blushing and like the stickers to the correct place so i got a question in the chat here so uh, danish says how would you um how would you identify the landmarks um I believe there is a project that Inspired AI does that specifically goes over identifying the landmarks. I think once you've identified the face, like, and you can kind of get it in this nice, like once you've generated a bounding box um, and you can kind of zoom in and just care about the specific location in, in any given image, um, there are definitely like uh, machine learning models that have been trained to identify where the ears are, where the nose is, where the lips are, et cetera. Um, and then give you coordinates of those. And once you have those coordinates, it's actually really easy to then, you know, generate the 3D model. And you can imagine how you could go from that to the, um, to, to the filter application. And Leo asks, is it possible to go through that process with end-to-end -end learning? Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that, Leo? I mean, just, um, I guess my question was just um, removing the intermediate layer of having to detect facial landmarks and just go directly from face detect face detection to image processing yeah so you could um we find that in a lot of computer computer vision tasks kind of having like more specialized tools generates better results there's a really really famous um object detection network uh known as yolo or like you only look once um, and they have a similar, again, the reason why it's so efficient is because they kind of segment out these tasks. So they first um, generate a bunch of bounding boxes. This is kind of a slightly different task, but it's a similar output where they're able to, to become very efficient through this kind of segmented task strategy. Um, they generate like a bunch of bounding boxes, and then they use some statistical methods to kind of filter out um, the unnecessary bounding boxes. And then from that, they do object detection. So you kind of figure out where all the generic objects are. And then from there you can do categorization and it's just kind of a simple timeline here. So um, yeah, doing, you know, doing, using like a single network, you know, a single pipeline could potentially be more efficient. Um, but depending on the scenario, like it might, you might yield like more uh, consistent results using something like this. So it really depends on the, on the task. Good question. Anything else on that? I hope that answered it. <laughs> Cool, okay. So we will now kind of go into more the more, more of the specifics of how do we uh, go from images to numbers. So um, in something like natural language processing, you know, there's a big problem with like actually turning the language into something that you can give to a neural network. Um, we'll see that in the context of images though, it's actually not as bad. Um, the kind of, they kind of come pre-wrapped in a form that works well for us. And we'll see that here in a second. So um, can someone throw in the chat, how do, does any, if anybody knows or anybody has any guesses, how do we represent images um, in the form of numbers? By converting uh, the pixel, like by converting the pixels into numbers. Yeah, good Yashu. So yeah, we see Ananya says pixels. Uh, Kostub, uh, or no, yeah, Kostub says uh, with a matrix, and yeah, you guys are all right. So we would have a matrix of pixels. We can see here a nice visual representation of that. So if we just zoom in, so with you know with a nice detailed picture, you can't really see it, um, but if we zoom in far enough, uh, we start to actually see the pixelation here, where each of these uh, individual squares is represented by a number that defines the the. In this case, since it's black and white, it'd just be purely like the brightness intensity. Um, so in this scenario, they're kind of doing like an artist representation of uh, this this more vague S shape that we see in the dog's ear, and we're going to take a closer look th look at that in a second, um, looking at the matrix of numbers. Cool. Okay, so uh, we see here um, this matrix that is supposed to kind of represent. If we go backwards. Uh, this S here, you know, defined with the brightness intensity values for each pixel. Can someone, I believe you should be able to annotate on the screen. Uh, can someone or, or multiple people uh, show us where that like darker S would be uh, resolved in this matrix of numbers? I Are you guys able to right? annotate? I hope. There we go. Yeah. 
So you can see again that the, the S was darker than the surrounding ear, right? And darker values are going to be representing uh, are going to be represented by uh, zeros, right? So less light. Oh, I just cleared that one, but yeah, you can see if you just follow the the leading zeros here, you get an S kind of all the way through, something like that. Does anybody have any guesses as to why this isn't as important? But any guesses as to why we use zero through two fifty five? Niveta says the yeah, RGB scale. So yeah, we'll see that in a second. Um, we do still use 255, the zero through 255 um, yeah, for RGB, but I'm seeing from Nolan and uh, Bennett, yeah, binary power of two scale. Yeah, so zero through 255, that actually equals, right? If you include the zero, you get 256 numbers, which is equivalent to two to the eighth, which is exactly one byte, which if you know anything about computers, you'll know that's like a very uh, efficient and, and nice and easy um, amount of information information to be transferring around. So using one byte for every single uh, intensity value is a really nice thing to 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 do, just because it's it's very efficient. Sweet. Um, let me continue here. All right. Again. So yeah. As far as now that we actually, in case anybody you know didn't already know, now that we know that this is how images are represented uh, in computers, um, you could kind of see even even more clearly like where uh where machine learning becomes extremely necessary for represent for recognizing even the most simple of objects again like a two-year-old could you know identify the difference between dogs and cats by just looking at the pictures visually however you know give that to a computer like how would you ever code that up it's just not something you could do by hand uh Kostub says that doesn't mean also doesn't that mean if you use hexadecimal you can start rgb alpha uh as one byte since each thing would be two bits i believe so i'm trying to hexadecimal is just like four bits is one placeholder for one like hex value right like any hex hex number can be rep or no is that no that's how you go from wouldn't hex be base 16 yeah, it's base 16. So yeah, so it's like it's like four bits, right? Like one placeholder is, is equivalent to you can kind of compress it that way. Yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty of like a lot of memory storing techniques you can use um, in that context for now. I mean, I was just referring to like why that number a lot of people uh, who are newer are wondering like why 255 and that's just because like, well, I mean, the actual answer beyond it being one byte is it's sort of like a nice balance between being, you know, large enough to represent like a nice fine gradient of of intensity values but small enough to be efficient you know with with one byte um so yeah uh as one byte since each thing would be two bits i believe so i'm trying to hexadecimal is just like four bits is one placeholder for one like hex value right like any hex hex number can be rep or no is that no that's how you go from wouldn't hex be base 16? Yeah, it's base 16. So yeah, so it's like it's like four bits, right? Like one placeholder is, is equivalent to you can kind of compress it that way. Yeah, I mean there's there's plenty of like a lot of memory storing techniques you can use um in that context for now. I mean, I was just referring to like why that number. A lot of people uh, who are newer are wondering like why 255. And that's just because like, well, I mean, the actual answer beyond it being one byte is it's sort of like a nice balance between being, you know, large enough to represent like a nice fine gradient. Of, of intensity values, but small enough to be efficient, you know, with, with one byte. Um, so, yeah. And also, yeah, so if you're using a hex, like one, what is it, like one word of information, right? So eight bytes, yeah, you're right. That would be RGB plus an alpha. Um, I know, I, I don't think you'd be able to do that in one byte. You'd need, you need four bytes, right? For one byte for R, one byte for G, one, byte for b or am i interpreting that wrong i think like if it's hexadecimal you have zero through nine and then you would have like a through f right mm -hmm. so that would mean that in two bytes you can store 16 squared so up to 256 i mean two bits in two byte no but like you can't 
if a bit is sort of like the fundamental, like you would still need more than that to represent like a one or a two or an A or a B, right? You still need one byte for those characters, if you will, if you're going to use like ASCII, for example. Um, like you can't really, there is kind of like an information limit there for like how much you can represent by just like one placeholder of like a zero or one. But you're right, you would, it would be efficient for like, uh, like a lot of computer memory systems that use like words as their unit if you if you've ever heard of a word that's uh, i believe four bytes of information um so one word would be one pixel in the rgb plus a alpha context oh, oh yeah and, like a hexadecimal and, would require two yeah so yeah you you'd, you'd, need, you'd need a little bit more yeah. than that i'm sure i think yeah okay cool any other questions or observations Okay, great. So I think we all have, you know, we've heard many people have been alluding to this already, um, but in order to represent color, we actually need three matrices. So instead of just one, you know, for grayscale, you need one for each uh, color intensity value. And with a variety of, or with basically you, you have any combination of red, green, and blue can generate pretty much any color. Again, like you're gonna kind of have some coarseness if you try to do it with like 128, right? You, you, you kind of want that balance. And I believe like some fancier computers nowadays, maybe a lot of them even um, use actually, uh, what is it like 512 or like even uh, 1,040, uh, 1,024, you know, to get, you know, theoretically like more complex and even deeper colors than just 255. But um, for our purposes, we'll, we'll just kind of think of it in the 255 turn and it's just fine. Um, one thing that's weird about this that in case you haven't like heard of it before or, or done with anything with it before is that because you're combining light um the the colors are are like are additive as opposed to subtractive so if you're talking about pigment right you mix if you mix like all the colors of your like uh paint wheel for example you'd end up with like a brownish like you know green brown or something like that but mixing all of the colors of light uh that would combine back to being white light um, so just that's just like one thing to consider because it's a little bit counterintuitive if you haven't thought of it like that before. Because um, the analogy I like to use for like how this actually works, in case anybody's wondering, or if you're still like a little bit unclear, is if you've ever like taken like a magnifying glass or like a microscope and looked really closely um, at like a color printer paper or like a color magazine or something, you'd see like these little cells of color and each one has like a certain amount of each of the printer color distinctly in them and those cells actually all combine to generate like a full color image um, but again it's slightly different because it's light so they're kind of combining in that way oh yeah i hope wait so is my internet bad or is that not okay we're good all right <laughs> okay uh, that was okay good disaster averted sweet okay so any questions well, we'll do a couple of like uh, understanding exercises in a second here, but any questions so far um, regarding uh, the, the representation of, of color images in the form of, of a matrix or how, how are we fitting on that concept? Thumbs up, okay, cool. Good. So I think we'll do a quick uh, understanding check here. Mm, let me see how much time do we have? 22. I think we have time to, we'll, we'll skip this. Yellow, I believe is like all red and all green. Again, if you did that with like paint, it would not work obviously, but because we're combining light, uh, it does work, right? So it's a completely different like scheme for, for combining colors. Um, and then for white, again, you should, that should be 255, 255, 255. For black, it would just be zeros. And then gray would be anything in between white and black. So as long as it's the same number here for red, green, and blue, you get some variation of gray. Okay, sweet. Looks like Alexander fixed. Perfect. Okay, good to hear. Coolio. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you can see here, those are the answers. All right, so quick uh, understanding check here. Um, 
throw in the chat how many intensity values or just like intensity values is synonymous with just like how many numbers are there in a 1000 by 1000 uh, RGB image. And just for reference, this image, these pictures are not to scale. So these should be squares uh, if they're a thousand by a thousand, but the RGB part applies still. Good, yeah, so Samvid said 1,000 times 1,000 times three, exactly right, and that would be a total of 3 million. Sweet, so this will be the end of the uh, image representation portion. We'll get now for the rest of lecture into actual uh, neural network stuff. So any questions on this before we move on? I think we're all doing pretty well with this so far. Sweet, okay. So moving on to actual neural networks. Um, so I would normally ask you guys for like different algorithmic rules to like classify dogs and cats, but I'm it would basically just be leading to the same spiel that I gave with the um, stop sign thing. Like we'll find that no matter what, uh, yeah, no, no matter what rule we could come up with like to, to classify these, not only would the rule probably an probably be inadequate like a lot of people talk about like the pointy ears versus the floppy ears but you know with that if, if you use that rule you'll find that like lots of dogs still have pointy ears and even some cats have floppy ears but um, beyond that uh, you'd realize that those rules are essentially impossible to code by hand like you just can't like this is a very idealized picture of a cat you know nicely facing the camera like pr they're pretty much their eye line is pretty much perpendicular with with like the plane of the picture um, and, you know, most pictures are never as perfect as that. And like coding something that could recognize pointy ears is just not something feasible. So like you just could never do that by hand, basically. Um, only, only, only if you like knew exactly uh, from what perspective and like what distance every single cat picture is going to be, then you could maybe do, you know, create some sort of like filter system. Uh, but with, aside from that scenario, you really just can't do this by hand, which is why we need machine learning. Is everybody okay with that premise before I move on to, to actually explaining um, new neural, net, neural networks in general? Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Looks good. Awesome, okay, great. So again, so simple classification. I mean, I don't even know why they mentioned logistic regression here, like that wouldn't work, but you know, even, even something more intelligent and like targeted at like your specific task, just wouldn't work. Uh, it's just not feasible. Images are just too complex, especially now that we know how they're represented as numbers. Like, it's, I mean, if again, if you're having trouble with that, like instead of picturing this, picture uh, this, but much bigger and trying to like write code that recognizes stuff from that. Cause that's what the computer sees again. So yeah, so again, that's why we need neural networks. And we'll see as again, as Leo alluded to uh, at the end, we'll see hopefully some explanation of convolutional neural networks. So even these uh, neural networks that we'll see in a second here um, are like kind of inadequate. Like they work okay on images, but CNNs are really what you need to use, but uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. So for now, um, we'll do a quick, this is like a one minute video just explaining um, the inspiration for a neural network. So let me reshare with sound so we can all hear it. Neurons communicate with each other, relaying messages throughout your body and powering all of your thoughts and actions. Neurons talk to each other using both electrical and chemical signals. Messages start as electrical signals traveling rapidly down a neuron. These signals are called action potentials. When they reach the gap between two neurons, the messages need some help to get across. The information is transformed from an action potential into a chemical message, which crosses the gap called a synapse. The release of those chemical messengers can trigger an action potential in the neuron on the other side of the synapse, conveying the message onward. Or it can quiet the message. This happens over and over and over. And with repeated activity, the synapse gets stronger so the next message is more likely to get through. That way, neurons learn to pass on important messages and ignore the rest. 
This is how our brains learn and adapt to an ever-changing world. Sweet. Okay, so that's sort of a general overview of how the brain works. Um, and there are definitely some extremely important differences to note that we'll, that I'll maybe talk about a little bit later. But, you know, in a very broad sense, um, yeah, so Leo says logistic regression. Yeah, we, we won't talk too much about that. It's sort of like a probability thing. Um, definitely distinct from machine. Well, it's similar to machine learning. Like it has some machine learning aspects, but it's it's just a different type of, of function used for classification. It's a little bit more simple uh, than, than neural networks. So yeah, um, but as I was saying, um, the, the notion of these neural networks definitely draws inspiration from the brain. Um, I believe the original, like some of the first neural networks that people were building, you know, back in the eighties and stuff like that were inspired when they like, there's this really famous experiment when they were showing uh, like cats, like these different slits of light um, and then looking at specific like neurons near, near to their eyes. And they realized that like only like they were mainly good at detecting what are called edges. So just basically like any sort of like distinct color gradient. Um, but they weren't actually like, they weren't attuned to de like detecting full size shapes. Like if they showed the, the cat, like a picture of like a mouse or something like those neurons didn't uh, light up. But if they showed them like very, very simple shapes, they did light up, which which led to the conclusion that like, you know, neurons closer to where the eye are, are detecting like very generic shapes. And then further into the brain, it's actually putting those kind of pieces together, which is uh, very similar to what um, a convolutional neural network will do. Again, neural networks, standard neural networks are slightly different, but um, in essence, they're, they're, they're definitely inspired by the brain. You can see here the structure. This is kind of a, a cartoon version of, of a neuron in a brain. And if and this is just one of them. So in your brain, you'd have like this part here, you'd have, you know, that as well here. So you'd have another neuron here connected to more of the ends of other neurons. And you have more of these going out like that. And like, you just have this giant sort of infinite loop in your brain of, of like, I think billions. I don't really know the scale of how many neurons you have. I'm guessing billions or maybe, maybe trillions, but billions sounds right uh, of these all kind of interconnecting. And the same is true for uh, actual neural networks in, in the computer, uh, except instead of like electrical and, and specifically chemical signals, that's like one of the main distinctions is that these, these neural networks and computers do not use chemical signals. Um, instead of that, we have uh, numbers being passed through. Cool. Okay. So that's sort of the inspiration. So now we'll get into a quick demo or exercise. Um, just to, this is like, Basically, I mean, this, this is a real example of like an actual very, very, very simple neural network, but it is like once we actually figure out how information passes through here, uh, you'll understand how it passes through any neural network of any size, right? So this is kind of a smaller version, but it is, uh, it is like the same in essence in, sort of in, term, in terms of the math that we'll be doing um, as, as any size neural network just scaled down. So. Uh, to start, we're going to kind of do like a simplified example here. So throw in the chat. Uh, let's get some ideas going. What would you consider? Like, what do you ask yourself, maybe implicitly or explicitly, uh, when you're trying to determine if you want to eat lunch, uh, you know, at a particular given moment? Like, what are these questions that kind of run through your head? Again, they don't have to be explicit. Like, what are some things you kind of consider internally, even um, when you're when you're going out to, to determine if you want to eat lunch or not? Okay, great. Yeah, Antonio says, is it lunchtime? Am I hungry? Awesome. Yeah. How much, how much do I weigh? Yeah. Do I, is, is, is this the time in my life to be eating lunch? Yeah. Hunger lunchtime is lunch made yet. Price is an important one. So sometimes this gets a little bit confusing because some of these, so we'll see in a second that we're going to be, they, they use some like mostly yes or no questions like true or false, but um, for the, for the con for talking about like the time questions or how much do I weigh? you could easily reduce that to being like a true or false where you say like, do I weigh between this or that? Or, you know, is it between 11 AM or 2 PM? And then it would kind of work still. Um, okay. A hundred billion neurons. That's kind of around what I was thinking. Yeah. The G yeah, GPT two or GPT three, a really common, a really powerful uh, natural language processing network has they, I mean, they just kind of go crazy with the comp compute power. Um, <laughs> Okay, cool. So um, I think you guys pretty much got those. Again, there's no, there's no correct answer here, or no wrong answer either. 
um, they just kind of fill these in for us. So again, you guys definitely got the hungry, the food. This is like kind of a lesser, a less obvious one, but maybe something you still want to consider if in fact you do have allergies. So in this specific scenario, we're going to say that we were hungry. Right? A one is corresponding to a true. Uh, the food is tasty. A one is corresponding to a true again, and I am not allergic, right? So the zero corresponds to false. So these are sort of like your, in, your initial inputs here. And for reference, these are like multiplication symbols and these are addition symbols. They use the same thing, just tilted. So that might be a little bit confusing, but yeah, these are adding, these are multiplication. Cool, okay. So um, then the next thing we wanna consider is how important is each input, right? So how much do I care about the fact that I'm hungry? How much do I care about I'm allergic? Um, does somebody wanna give me like a quick like ranking perhaps, or like what would be the number one most important thing to consider here? Let's just go with the, the number one thing initially. Yeah, usually we get like an even split between allergic and hungry. Um, yeah, allergic, I think we can agree. Uh, if Assuming that you have some sort of allergy, allergic would be most important to consider, right? So it doesn't matter how hungry you are, you probably don't wanna like, you know, eat a bunch of peanuts. Uh, assuming that you would die from that. So we won't, we care most about the allergic, but a close second, as we'd all also agree, would be the hungry thing, right? So we care more about being hungry than the food being tasty. Like even if it's just like kind of bland, like you'd rather eat that than starve. So, um, you know, hungry is more important than tasty, but allergic is more important than all those. So the way that we would reflect that in this scenario is by assigning magnitudes of the weights uh, corresponding to that. So we would make the magnitude of the allergic weight, the highest, and then you'd make hungry the next highest and then tasty the least. And we'll see in a second. In this scenario, we're assuming that like, if it's a positive output, we'll say, yes, we will eat. If it's a negative output, no, we won't eat. So then these weights kind of act, you know, cor corresponding to that. So you can see the magnitude still follows that ranking, but we make allergic strongly negative so that if you are allergic, you generally get a negative output, which means you won't eat. Um, but the rest of them, I think, make, make sense as well. So uh, we're going to say hungry has a weight of three, tasty has a weight of one, allergic has a weight of negative 10. Um, and then basically the next step here is just to multiply across, right? So you multiply this one by this three, uh, this one by this one, and zero by negative 10, which gives you, and then again, you add everything up to calculate what they call a weighted sum, which gives us four. So in this very, very simple neural network without any additional frills, uh, we decided that this would mean we do eat lunch, right? So positive means yes, negative means no. So in this case, four obviously is greater than zero. So we say yes. So that's that for this simple example. However, uh, in a real neural network, um, there's a couple of additional steps before we actually kind of look at this output um, for calculation purposes. So we're gonna actually tackle those right now with the same network. So Again, in the, if you were using this network to like determine if you wanted to eat lunch or not, you, maybe you would just look at the weighted sum. I think you know there's enough logic there. I think it kind of makes sense. But in a real neural network, in order to build complexity and actually generate, um, you know, more meaningful mathematics in your neural network, you need to add a couple of additional steps. So uh, the next step is what's known as the bias. Um, so I don't know. The bias is is tough because mathematically it's not very interesting. Like with regard to all the math that you do, like for calculating gradients and all this stuff, the bias kind of drops out a lot of the time. And like, it doesn't really, like you, you want to tweak it. Um, all, all Anything here that's like a orange triangle is a tunable parameter. So this is something that would change as you train the network, but the bias is like the least interesting of them. Um, the best way I can explain what we do with the bias is, let's say we had a network where you're trying to classify uh, dogs and cats but the, the data that you give the network is consists of 10,000 dogs and 100 cats. Um, basically, the bias is going to attempt to reflect the fact that as far as the network is concerned, most of the world just consists of dogs anyway. So you want to bias in favor of dogs. So uh, again, the bias is the way I was, it, was, it was explained to me um, is that it's supposed to reflect the bias that exists within your training data. So that's kind of that. It's not as important. Um, a lot of neural networks actually do just fine without having any bias at all. Um, my research involves binary neural networks. So neural networks where the weights are either negative one and one. Um, and, and we don't, definitely don't have a bias because that wouldn't really make any sense if all of our calculations are being done using uh, negative one and one. So 
we don't have a bias and our networks do pretty pretty all right so it's not completely necessary but you can get a little bit more uh generalizing um with a bias so we're going to keep it in there for for these purposes but it's not super important any questions any quick questions on that before i move past it because i'm not really going to acknowledge it uh, again because it's just kind of like kind of dangling there it's not really like a super essential part of the network math okay cool all right so one thing that is definitely essential to the network uh, is the activation function so before you generate an output for a particular layer uh, you need some sort of activation function what's also known as a non-linearity um, in order to build complexity in your model so in this case, we're using the max function between zero and X. This is a super, super common function to use as your activation. Um, it's also known as ReLU, which stands for like, I think rectified linear unit. Again, it sounds all scary. And, and even if you've never seen this before, it looks all scary. Uh, that all the max function does is it takes the bigger of the two inputs. So in this case, you can see the max between zero and 4.2 is 4.2. So just so I can, again, I wanna do this just so we all kind of overcome this Again, when I first saw the max function, I think in like a computer science probability class I took last year, um, like the first five minutes, I was like, I've never seen this before. This looks all scary. So let me just do a quick like little uh, exercise in the chat here. So can someone tell me what the max is between, let's say, uh, let's do this max five, four and seven. What would the output of that be? Good. Okay. Very quickly. Lots of sevens. Perfect. Okay, great. I think you guys got it. Um, again, yeah, it just takes the bigger of the two. So in this case, the, one of the default numbers for this max is a zero, um, which means effectively uh, this ReLU function, all it does is it takes negative inputs and sets them to zero and it takes positive inputs and it passes them through. So if I were to really quickly graph that, just like in the XY plane, uh, it would look like this. Oh, yeah, that's a really bad XY plane. It would be zero in the negative, right? So anything negative that gets passed in, uh, zero will be bigger, right? So you're gonna output zero. And then once it becomes positive, it just passes it through as if it's just like Y equals X, right? So it's gonna look like that. So it actually is linear in the positive direction, but as long as it's like sort of piecewise, uh, it's technically non-linear, so it works. Um, and more importantly than actually how the ReLU function works is why we need an activation function or a nonlinearity at all. And the best way that I can describe it, um, actually it's easier if I wait until we get the full diagram of multiple layers. So let's go, so you can see here, now our final output is 4.2. Um, well, I'll skip this for a second, I'll come back to it. But now if I can just use this, this slightly more complicated diagram real quick. So now in this diagram, just for anybody confused, uh, each arrow, represents a different weight. Um, and then anywhere where the arrows are converging, that's where you're adding subsequent values. So you can see just like if I were to follow some information, you take an input again, this could be like one, zero, one, one, something like that. Um, and you would multiply it by a weight every time it gets passed through one of these arrows. So you get a different weighted sum in each of these neuron locations. Um, and then here, once you kind of accumulate all the information at each of these nodes, that's when you pass it through the activation function and you add the bias if you want it to. Um, and then you can take that output as if it's a new input to this new layer here, right? So you multiply it across again, using every single arrow being a different weight uh, and, some, and again, amalgamating all, those, all that new information, again, multiplied through different weights at these new neurons. And again, before uh, passing on to the next layer, which I guess would actually be the output, um, you need to apply the activation function. So I'll actually explain why we need that right now. So the reason why we need to apply an activation function between every single layer, uh, if I could use a quick mathematical analogy here, I'm gonna do, a, I'm gonna write a function in the chat and I'm gonna want, I'm gonna have you guys uh, tell me back what is it equivalent to. So I'm gonna write this function real quick. Let's say plus four. So can someone tell me what that function is equivalent to? So if you didn't know, you know, a ton of math or like you just looked at it from far away, that maybe looks like a very complicated function, you know, a polynomial even. Um, but we can see here in the beta says, yeah, Alexander as well. We all agree. It's just a very, no matter how many terms I add there, uh, it's still just going to be a singular linear function. Like, again, if you didn't know much about math, you might think, oh, it looks like this. You know, it's a lot of terms. It's probably going to be some complicated polynomial. Um, 
But in reality, if you just reduce, if you just reduce the terms, you're just going to end up with something that looks like this. Um, man, I, I nailed that origin right there. Uh, but yeah, so the same thing applies to neural networks if you don't add a nonlinearity, if you don't add an, an activation function. So uh, in essence, adding an activation function between layers would be equivalent to doing something like this with the function that I just wrote. Instead of doing what, instead of doing it without just multiplying those terms, uh, I'm going to say something like this. I don't know. I'll do sine, do like sine four x. I don't know. Sine isn't very isn't a very common one, but um, let's do tan h of that one, five x, and plus like let's say I don't know, seven x squared plus. Um, let's do cos of uh, x. So this is kind of like the mathematical equivalent, mathematical equivalent of doing, um, of adding uh, a nonlinearity between each layer. So you can see here now by adding nonlinear functions or applying nonlinear functions to each of these terms, uh, it no longer reduces. I mean, maybe, I, I don't know. I didn't actually check beforehand. Maybe there's like some like, uh some identities that we can use to reduce it a little bit but as far as i'm concerned like that looks pretty much irreducible in my opinion right so there's no way you can kind of compress that function and make it simplified um so it, it clearly harbors more complexity uh than the prior one and the same exact thing happens for neural networks right so if you don't apply a nonlinearity between each layer all the linear all of the layers that you have mathematically speaking they compress to being just one layer so you end up no matter how many how, how deep your network is you're just going to end up with like um what is it called i think like a svm I, don't, I think that's what it is like an svm classifier uh, a support vector machine so it's just like a very simple linear classifier yeah tan h is yeah there's there's i mean i was just doing like any random fancy looking function you can use is generally going to be non-linear so um anything like that and yeah tan h is actually a common one to use for an activation function that one particular forces values between, I think, negative one and one. I don't know, something like that. Um, so yeah, that one is actually slightly more common. It's pretty inefficient for calculation though. So more, most people prefer, prefer like ReLU, but um, yeah, that's like in essence why we need an activation function because it forces the network to build up complexity where otherwise it would just compress and be very, very boring. Um, so that is definitely like a high level like algebra concept. Um, so I'm gonna pause here for questions regarding uh the activation function or just like building up these layers again now that we're kind of looking at like a real uh you know slightly more complex neural network um while you guys consider the questions if you want to put them in the chat or feel free to unmute um, i'm going to kind of go backwards to here uh and just show you like what the what the corresponding features are so we can see this each time you see like a multiplication like this weight here this is like an arrow and you can see them converging and being added and this all this here is sort of con uh, conveyed um, using like that. This entire thing here would be one of those nodes that all the arrows are converging at. So in that node where all the arrows are converging, you're going to generally have a bias, sometimes not, but generally. And then you're also going to apply an activation function there. And then from that, you can apply, you can you know put that output elsewhere by also applying weights before summing it up somewhere else. So any questions so far? Because that is in essence like how how neural networks, these standard fully connected networks, at least that, that's how they work. We're doing pretty good on time, actually. Um, I think I think this one's a pretty important question, but when do you know to apply a particular activation function? Because there's so many, there's relu, leaky relu, and yeah, there's a whole bunch. Yeah, there's tons of them. Um, as like as far as I'm concerned, like, well. If you're working with certain types of networks, it might be better. Like again, I'm I have specialized in like a very specific type of network, like a binary, a binarized network. So we have like we're very limited as far as like what activations we can use because we need to force all of our results to be between negative or be exactly negative one or one. So we're I'm restricted in that sense. But uh, a lot of the time, truthfully, like in the machine learning world, it's just guess and check. To be honest, like they're really like especially you know if, if you've only been doing machine learning for like a couple of years like you know with a lot of experience you can definitely develop like some intuition with how the vectors pass um but a lot of the time it is guess and check i'll say that the, the activation function definitely strongly correlates with uh what's known as the vanishing gradient problem so for certain 
um, for certain activations, they prevent. So the vanishing gradient problem very, very generally is just like it basically, uh, if your network isn't built correctly, um, you get what are called vanishing gradients and your model just doesn't train. So depending on what your problem is, uh, changing the activation between like, yeah, Relu or like leaky Relu can help with the vanishing gradient problem. Cause like standard Relu again, like you're going to zero out a lot of stuff. So if you're doing late leaky Relu, which I think kind of look, oh, that's a really bad X, Y plane. Um, if Riki, Le leaky Relu kind of looks like this, I believe, right. Where you kind of have like, so you still have some sort of non-zero slope in the negative. Um, that definitely can help with like the vanishing gradient problem because you're not zeroing everything out that is negative. So uh, I think the activation strongly, cho your choice of activation strongly correlates with um, if you're experiencing that issue or not. Yeah, intermediate mount layers mean more weights. Yeah, exactly. So you can imagine uh, if you were to kind of, ex this is like, again, this is this would be a network with uh, what are called two hidden layers. So you have an input layer. So you see, like if this was an image, you'd, you know, you'd see the image. And then the output layer is like, you know, something that you analyze. Like you, you look at these numbers and you determine, you know, what is the model predicting? Um, so that would be, that would leave two layers in between that are hidden. Um, so more layers equals more weights, which theoretically means more complexity. There is like an upper bound to how, you know, much complexity you can get by simply adding more layers. Um, but that kind of, that's like a, you know, that's a problem that Google has because they have like a million GPUs. So uh, they kind of explore those limits. Um, standard researchers generally wouldn't. <laughs> Any other questions? Big, big, big questions, small questions, anything like that. Yeah, so Nivetha says there would be like 100, minute, 100 intermediate layers in higher computer vision programs. Yeah, I think, I don't know. I think I'm trying to remember from like my, the lectures that I took at Stanford that basically talk specifically about like, you know, the theory behind these, the architecture. I think it might level out maybe around like 50 even, but that's where like the number of neurons within each layer is not like, you know, thousands, if not, you know, ton, like tens of thousands. So you can have really, really wide uh, neurons. Um, but I don't remember. I, maybe I'm thinking of like blocks because they'll have blocks of like certain types of like mathematical transformations that contain layers within themselves. So maybe that's what I'm thinking of. I really couldn't give you that. that I wouldn't know. I, I like, yeah, that, that, that's a tough one. The specific number. Uh, not the neuron size, but the number of neurons per layer that would depend, right? So like if you have like a hundred lay a hundred neuron or I mean a hundred, that's like a small network, but like these really, really big networks, I really don't have a firm grasp on the scale because like for research purposes, you generally don't make them that big just because like it's really computationally expensive. So we generally work with like kind of smaller proof of concept networks. So I'm not really used to like what those numbers actually are. But good question. Yeah. So but I mean I think it might have been you, but someone else said like, you know, the GPT three model has like uh, 173 billion weights. So, and again, that's the same type of weight as what we see here, right? This would be one weight, or that's a bad circle, but each arrow would be one weight. So you can imagine how that translates to a certain very large size of network and a certain depth and width of network as well. My intuit, my hunch is though, that you definitely get diminishing returns after like maybe 50 layers. Cause like, there's only so much complete, like, again, that's where you'd maybe run into like vanishing gradient problems. Cause if you're just like, sort of like filtering the information more and more and more at a certain point, you just lose all information entirely. So there is like a limit to how many layers you'd want for sure. All right. If anybody has any questions, definitely feel free to on this stuff. Definitely feel, feel free to drop them in the chat, but um, with that, I'm going to transition to talking about the training of a neural network. So I'm going to try to not uh, use too many calculus concepts because I think that can get dicey really quickly. Um, well, just for reference, who here has uh, done like uh, calc AB, just like the derivative part of it? Don't have, we don't have to worry about integration yet. Um, got one person raising their hand. Ananya, cool. So some people, maybe not the majority haven't though. That's totally normal. Yeah. So we got a couple of people. Okay, cool. So yeah, differentiation is, is pretty much all you need. 
um, along with like some uh, intuition about matrices. Um, okay, so cool. So then we're gonna go over this. So basically, uh, you know, depending on the network task, you're gonna have a certain number of input outputs. So if this is if this network is attempting to classify images uh, of cats and dogs, you'd have an output for the cat category, and you'd have you'd have an output for the dog category. Um, so depending on you know what the network outputs, you'd consider it like a bad output or a good output. So we'll take a look at sort of what I mean by that in a second here. We're going to go over the very generic uh, conception of what loss is. Um, and then I think I have a pretty good method for explaining how to actually train a network without. Yeah, you definitely, you know, you need the chain rule for for, for sure um, to actually perform back prop. But um, I think there's, there's, a, there's a pretty decent way of explaining this without calculus. And you'll see if you do know calculus, you'll see how it very, very uh, closely re resembles taking a derivative. So we'll take a look at that in a second. For now, though, um, Throw in the chat if you want to throw like your ranking like let's say the first thing that you put is the best and this last is the worst so what what would be the ranking for like the best uh network output given that this is the input again we can see it's clearly a dog so we want to be classifying dogs so which one was the best and which one was the worst feel free to throw in the chat here yeah got lots of yeah for sure we should be all in agreement that three is the best, right? It's clearly very confident as a dog and it's not really giving any sort of strong output for a cat, right? So we would want this, like this, we would assign what we would call low loss. We would give it a low loss value. Um, and we see also people saying network one uh, was the, yeah, people, yeah. So network one is definitely, it's still classifying dog technically, Um but with less confidence, I think I would say that network two is probably the worst because it's, you know, getting it incorrect and being kind of confident with it saying it's cat. So um, it's it's close between these two, but I would say uh, network two is probably worse. Um, yeah, yeah. People gravitate to the to the one and three. I don't know why I've, I've got, given this lecture a lot and like people don't for some reason just don't really look at it. I don't know why it happens every time. Um but yeah, so we would say network three has the lowest amount of loss. And, and for anybody wondering, a loss function, um, it's just a like sort of a predefined function that you would, you know, kind of write. Oh, I mean, they have tons of like specified loss functions that basically just determine how good or bad the network is. So the higher the loss, uh, the worse the network is. Um, so given that, that we know, I, I guess vaguely, I'm not going to go over like specific loss functions. That's not really what this lecture is going to be about. Uh, that's kind of too much in the weeds. But um, given that we understand, you know, generally what a loss function does, I'm going to kind of go over a quick scenario here um, and kind of explain using that uh, how we would actually train a network. So let's say again, let's say we have this input. So clearly it's a dog and we're trying to determine it, the network is trying to choose between dog and cat, right? So let's say this top category here is cat, just like before this bottom category is dog. And let's say the for this input, this particular network gave us scores of like, let's say 1.1 for cat. and uh, two point, I don't care, 2.2 .2 for dog. So that's our output. I mean, it got, it got it right, but maybe like, I mean, I don't know how someone could misinterpret this as a cat. So clearly, you know, we shouldn't, we should probably get, be getting a lower score for cat and we couldn't, it also wouldn't be bad if we got a higher score for dog, right? We want it to be as confident as possible. So given that the first step for training a neural network would be Basically, like, let's just look at a singular weight here. Let's, let's just take this weight. And all we're going to do is we're going to just say, eh, let's just guess and check. Let's just add 0.01. So let's say the weight was originally like, let's say it's like, you know, 0.76. We're just going to add 0.01. We're going to change it to 0.77 now. And let's say we change that. And then we're going to push, push this image through again and look at the new output, right? So we change one weight. And all we're going to do is look at the new output. Let's, so let's say the new output this time is one point zero for the cat category and 2.3 for the dog category. Can someone tell me in the chat if that was a positive or negative change that we made to the network? Was that a good or bad change? Hopefully everyone, yeah, let's get everyone responding here. Yeah, Antonio says good. What do we think? <laughs> Got two responses. Yeah, Leo says good, good. Awesome. So resounding, at least with three people, uh, resounding good here, right? So yeah, it's clearly a positive change. 
like, you know, it's more confident that's a dog and it's, it's more confident that it's not a cat, right? So it's cat score went down, dog score went up. So that's a good change. And essentially, um, what we just did again, we didn't, we're not going to go over like the specific loss function here, but, uh, we would be able to calculate the, the change in the loss function with respect to this particular weight. And that would, that's essentially like taking like a mini, uh, estimate of a derivative. Um, and basically what we do is we just do that guess and check style for every single weight in the entire network. I mean, again, this is a very naive version of, of what we would be doing in real life, like with uh, a gradient and taking a derivative, but, um, at least you could imagine like, you know, with a lot of compute power, you could basically just guess and check your way into training a network, right? So you do this for, you know, not only this image, but also every single weight and also, you know, multiple image images. So say times like 10,000. And then again, you guess and check for every weight. So maybe for the second weight, we added 0.01 and it made our scores, you know, worse, right? It was maybe made it thought, think it's more of a cat and less of a dog. Then maybe we would do go the reverse of that. We would minus subtract 0.01 and then check again. And maybe, it's still bad. Maybe we just want to keep it as is. Maybe it's a good weight already. And we go through and we check every single weight in the entire network over and over and over again. And we do that for, you know, thousands of images. And eventually you could imagine with enough compute power, uh, you could basically just try network that way. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Any questions on that? Again, that's a pretty quick crash course into how you do a pretty complex algorithm in real life. Like um, you, you generally, you actually need, you need calculus to do this. Um, and for anybody who does know calculus and wants to know, uh, very, very succinctly, what you do is you take the derivative of the loss function with respect to the weights and you end, you end up with this giant gradient vector, right? this giant vector of all of the derivatives that the weights have with respect to the loss function. And from that, you can basically intelligently change all of the weights, uh, incrementally. Um, and the, yeah, and there is like this, this problem, like with a really deep network, uh, taking the derivative directly would be almost impossible. Like you probably could do it, but it would just be like literal hell. Uh, so what you do is you, do, you use the chain rule as uh, Leo alluded to. And because you know the numbers for any particular sample that were actually passed through, you can kind of calculate ad hoc each derivative um, going backwards. And that's what's known as back propagation. So I hope you're not confused by this, you know, absolute mess of a diagram at this point, but um, that's pretty much like in essence, like the, the crash course to how you train a neural network um, definitely a difficult topic uh, to grasp in like five minutes. So I hope we did okay with that. Any questions on, on that? And I think we, I, Leo, I think, I think we're out of time. I mean, I'm good to stay for like 15 more minutes if we have more questions. I can also spend a little bit of time with convolutional neural networks if we want to, but I don't know. I think that's the end of the, the period. Uh, yeah, I think it is as well. Um... I don't know. Um, if you guys want to stay a little bit longer to hear about CNNs, like that's really where true computer vision is. Like yeah. Noah mentioned, uh, feel free to stick around. And I'll send out the attendance form right now. And I'll add a bonus question into the questionnaire for today. Sweet. About CNNs. Yeah. And I think um, in the name of time, I'll just do, again, I think I'll do like a quick crash course. So again, this is like a very simplified version. It's slightly more complicated than this. Um, but the essence of what, well, the problem with our current strategy is using this type of network, we have to stretch our image to being like a big vector of numbers. That's basically one dimensional before feeding it into this, this type of network. Um, so you lose all of the two dimensionality of it, right? You lose the fact that this row of pixels was above this row of pixels was above this row of pixels. And that, you know, fundamentally is more important of like how images actually work. Um, yeah, no worried. Uh, here, let me give you my, yeah, for anybody who wants to give, who, who has any questions for me, um, more than happy to, to definitely shoot me an email. So you can email me here. You. Um, right. Okay. So I'll do this quick, uh, this very quick crash course in what is normally like a full master's level course at Stanford. So uh, let's do the five minute version here. Um, so again, when you're feeding this, in, this, these images into a network like this, these are, these would be called a fully connected network. Um, you lose the fact that like you have two dimensions of information. So you have the same pixel values, but you lose the 2D, the 2D aspect, which is very important because, you know, you can imagine if you had like a really long monitor or something, I mean, if you were able to display all the pixels of an image in a row, you'd have no idea what it was, right? Um, 
like if you if you could see every single pixel stretch out in a line you would not be able to go backwards and generate that image and that kind of corresponds with real neural networks as well like they just it's not as helpful for them to give them that information in that form so the way we get around that is we keep the image in two dimensions but we force basically like a miniaturized neural network to scan every single part of the image and again this is this is kind of obscuring some stuff like we do this multiple times with multiple networks actually for one layer for example but uh, the essence of a convolutional neural network is that we force it to scan every single portion of the image. So we say, like, for example, we could, we see this neural network takes in four inputs. You could kind of think of this as like one filter for some type of information. And we force these four inputs to be uh, the top left corner of the image. And then we look at that output and we, we store it somewhere. Then we move that network over a little bit and, you know, look, look here. And then we store that now, we store that number again. And when we do that, uh, over and over again, scanning the entire image. And we build up what's known as, again, I don't know why, it, I guess they call it activations because you also apply the activation function to them, but you build up this block of activations, which basically represents like what things you found in the image. Uh, and then you can, what you can do is you can either just look at those directly or you can pass them through another convolutional filter. So you, then you scan that new block of, it, of, 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 of activations and, you know, eventually, uh, that's kind of where that, that puzzle pieces thing comes in when I was talking about the, the cats and like the, you know, you take edges and you kind of build up complexity that way. That's truly where that comes from. Right. So you start by maybe detecting like edges that look like let's, let's do, let's with like one more minute here, I'm going to do a really simplified example. So let's say we're trying to detect handwriting. If I can just get to like, like a big blank space here. So let's say we're trying to detect handwriting. The first few layers of our network, maybe would just detect like edges that look like this edges that look like this edges that look like that, you know, mirrors versions of, or I guess that those are the same edges, but like, you know, different versions of the same edges like that, that, uh, all that kind of stuff. So the first layer would just detect this stuff. And then maybe like, again, a vertical line, maybe uh, like, you know, got the bottom portion of like some sort of piece of, like, that's a full three, what am I doing? Um, so you detect just very simple shapes. The second layer maybe would detect like, you know, they would maybe start putting those shapes together and then again, since it's like it's handwriting, it's slightly more simple. Um, the last layer, you would again, you, you'd you'd put all those pieces together and eventually just classify. Okay, well, do these pieces of shapes combine to generate a three, or do they generate a two, or do they generate a one, or a ten, or or a nine, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of how you build up complexity using a CNN. Um, I hope that was like helpful and not super confusing. Um, I definitely recommend if you want to learn more about that. Uh, I think YouTube videos are probably the best thing to do for a CNN just because like understanding how the information passes through those networks is like very visual. Like if you can just see where the numbers are going, I think it's much more helpful than like, you know, reading it on a page. So definitely recommend just like Googling like uh, convolution. If we were to apply this to a uh, to image, so if we were to apply this to images, we would be using the gradient of a vector, right? So that would be, oh yeah, for in this slide, yeah, sorry, I was kind of just using the slide as a great as, as a blank slate. But yeah, you'd you'd take the gradient of the weights. Or no, sorry, you'd take the yeah derivative of the loss function with respect to the weights, um, and you actually do that over and over again. You use this thing called that's what the reason why they show it going up and down is because they're doing something called stochastic gradient descent. So they look at like a big gr group of images. And you look at like that amalgamated loss and then you make some you make one step based on that loss and then you do a new group of images and you kind of meander your way down this hill this slope of of loss function so eventually you reach up the bottom here um it's very similar in essence to like uh the euler method if you've ever done that to uh, approximate um differential equations you can kind of like slowly increment your way to something close to the answer using like uh, an approximation from the start. That's, it's very similar to that. Is um, it, um, so would this only work on convex functions? Um, I'm not or, or familiar with it, like, I haven't taken enough like theoretical math. To, what, what do you mean by convex functions? Like this picture here is like purely uh, like the actual dimension space of like the loss function with respect to the weight is like, you know, it's like, it would be like in the 10,000 dimension space if you have 10,000 weights. So this is like a very simplified picture of like two dimension space, but you can assume that there's always going to be some sort of local min for, for the loss function. Like, is that guess, what you're referring to? Like, um, so for some type of problems, like 
just for a simple example, like the mean square loss function, mm -hmm. um, it was made like that so that the cost would always have be convex, which means there's only one minimum, which is the global. Oh yeah. Okay. No, my, my bad. No, that's definitely not the case here. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of interesting theoretical mathematics that go behind it that like basically say there's like uh not infinite but like so many different options for like you know what is actually like a, a viable neural network um it's really a matter of like putting the correct architecture in place um yeah there, there's tons of different options if you want to learn more about that the fact that like it's kind of random and like you know you're kind of just using like statistics to to you know throw crap at the wall and eventually get a certain number of weights to work out uh, look up the lottery ticket hypothesis it's a really cool uh, paper on how neural networks like actually have like sort of potentially multiple predetermined solutions based on what their original weights are so if you look up that paper so um it wouldn't it's not possible to guarantee a convex cost function right um yeah no you definitely can't guarantee it but the point is like because you're working in such a high dimension space you can pretty much assume that like you're not actually stuck in like a true like local min here like you're not gonna you're not gonna end up like really ever stuck here unless your uh your training unless your um your training step is too big so what happens if you if you train if you increment your weights by like by too much you could end up jumping you know back and forth between here and here but as long as your uh learning rate is what it's called as long as your learning rate is small enough uh, you'll eventually uh, so, make it to the bottom. When I was learning about gradient descent, uh, I was taught that it always optimized to the local minimum since at that point the derivative is zero, right? So mm -hmm. you can't update anything. So how does it like go down to the global minimum? Like how do Good you, question. you that's, get a local minimum? That's why we use, that's why I was, we don't use pure gradient descent. We use stochastic gradient descent. So you actually look at like, you'd, you'd give the network in each, for each like training step, you give the network maybe like a hundred images and you look at that like sort of amalgamation output and generate a loss based on those 100 images and you make one step based on all of those images combined so that's where you actually can kind of you can get away with sort of meandering you know this way and that way and eventually getting your way down here uh, that that definitely helps with that with that process i see okay yeah i'll look into stochastic gradient oh yeah adam is definitely a way of fixing that Again, yeah, I think, like, be again, because it's such a high dimension space, um, again, yeah, like, Leo, correct me if I'm wrong with this, but because it's such a high dimension space, you can kind of get away with, like, just probabilistically speaking, like, you don't really care if you're in, you don't really care if you reach the quote unquote true global min, because, like, theoretically speaking, there's probably, like, thousands of those, if you will. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of where, where we're at with that, but that's like a, that's like a sort of a totally different field of like more theoretical, like training stuff, which I think is super interesting, but I don't know much about it. <laughs> good questions. Any, anyone else? And also Leo, if you want to jump in, it seems like, you know, you know, a good amount. So you can definitely uh, add to whatever I'm saying if you want. Yeah. I don't think I know as much as you, but yeah, I'd be glad to help out as well. Actually, just one note, um, to all of the people who are still here, it's just, um, if you want to actually go further with um, CNNs, it's just like, as Noah mentioned, it's really a nightmare to calculate all of the derivatives and then uh, do back propagation from there. And it's really better for you to use a library that already handles all of that stuff for you. And then you also don't have to um, manually write out what optimizer you want to use or like um, gradient descent. And with that, there are, probably, there are a lot of great videos out there for you, but yeah. we also have written an article at, like the Explorer Hacks team has written an article with a whole guide on how to use CNNs in PyTorch. So I think that's in the resources section of our Discord and feel free to check those out. Sweet, thanks. Um, I think, again, I, I'm totally good to answer more questions, but um, so yeah, I can, again, I can, I'll stay here for like another, let's say eight minutes. Uh, if there's more questions, any more like theoretical questions, I'm happy to, it's good to get my gears turning on it because I don't really think about that kind of stuff as much um you know when i'm doing kind of abstract research stuff so um definitely definitely throw me any questions you have for that we'll give it like a minute if we don't get any additional questions i think we can wrap up from there yeah
Yep, but until then, uh, thank you for coming, Noah. It's, it was really a pleasure to have you. Lots of really useful information for people who are uh, new to machine learning. Yeah, thanks, Leo. Thank you. It was fun teaching you guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So, thank you. Uh, make sure you guys fill out the attendance form. Uh, Leo, send it in the chat again, maybe. For anyone that didn't yeah, get it. I can do it again. Okay. All right, sweet. I'll, I'll be going. And if, if you need anything else from me, uh, Leo, feel free to email me. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, actually, I think I, I think I uh, sent you an invoice through um, uh, through Gmail already. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, if you have any issues with that, uh, please let me know. Sweet. All right. I'll, I'll search for that. Yeah, I, I, think, I think I remember seeing it. So yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you.